Vive.go has released this beautiful roadmap about how to become a senior developer. Let's look at the different tools that you're going to have to use in the future. Well, the most important ones, that is. First ones, collaboration tools. This is not too important. This is going to depend on the company where you are. Some use Slack, some Zoom, some Confluence. Some... This is going to depend on your company, and you can learn this pretty fast. So don't sweat over that. Number two here is going to be programming languages. So of course, if you are a front-end developer, you're going to have to use JavaScript because this is the one that your browser is going to know. And all the frameworks that you know, React, Angular, Svelte, Solid, whatever, are all going to be based on JavaScript. When it comes to backend development, many people are going to be using Python, but actually JavaScript also does the work because you now have technologies such as Node, Express, or Node.js that are going to be based on JavaScript. All of these other languages, this is Java, Python, C Sharp, Go. Honestly, you can do everything with JavaScript, so don't sweat too much about the other ones. Personally, I do everything with JavaScript and the superset called TypeScript. API development. So this is how your client is going to be speaking to the server. The client is going to be the device that the user uses to see your website. This could be a phone, a computer. You're probably watching this on a browser or an iPad or whatever. This is the client it's going to get information from a server right there. So which language are they going to speak to each other? Well, the most common one that you're going to see is called API. It's going to be the REST API. The way a REST API works is it's just going to send an HTTP request, which is going to be either get, post, delete, put, with a URL that is going to follow this format, for example, surveys in the plural, slash the details that you want, and the server is going to send back some information in the format called JSON. Honestly, 90% of what you're going to do is going to be based on this pattern. But there's also another one called GraphQL that you see here. GraphQL is going to be a bit different in a way that uh, it's going to be only based on post methods. And the client itself is going to say what exactly it wants from the server. Let's say you wanted to know all the matches played by your favorite football player. The client would probably have to do, make three requests to the server, one for all the players, and then once you would choose the player out of side of this list, uh, in, of the, uh, in this list, then it, you would have to click on this player and then it's going to send a request about the team of this player, and then you would have to look at all the matches played by this team. So this would be three different requests made by the client. In GraphQL API, all of this would be made with only one request. So the good thing is it's only one request instead of three. The bad thing is that the client needs to know lots of information that is inside of the database or inside of the server. Some people would say this is a violation of the separation of concerns rule. Out of all the projects I've had so far, 90% was REST API, 10% was GraphQL. So if you put them side by side, here is the REST API, one request made to players, one request made by teams, one requ request made to matches. So this could be happening even if the user doesn't click, actually. And here on the RefQL API, we see that this uh, client is making only one request to three different, uh, about three different things, so which is probably going to go to three different databases. gRPC, I've never had to use this, so don't sweat about this. Next is web servers. So what, does the web, what do web servers do? They simply make accessible the code that you write. The code that you write is going to be available on the internet so that people can download it and display it inside of their browser. So the first one you see is Nginx. The second one that you see is Apache Tomcat. This is more of a DevOps issue. Uh, if you want to learn one, you could go with Nginx, which is pretty easy to use. Honestly, this is not an emergency. It's always good to know how to use it, but it's uh, not the most important thing you're going to do. In the future, you're probably going to have more cloud technologies such as AWS or Google Cloud. These are more interesting technologies because you will probably have to deploy there. These are the two more, more important ones. We're going to speak about the others a bit later. Next, when it comes to authentication, this is made to make sure that the users are actually accessing data that they are allowed to see. So there's tokens, JWT, so JSON Web Tokens, OAuth2, and Cookies. If you had to choose only one today, I would say you should focus on JSON Web Tokens because this is very common. Uh, OAuth2 could be useful as well. This is what you can use to allow your users to log in with their Google or Facebook account. 
So right now I'm on Canva, for example, and you see I can log in with email or with Google and Facebook. If I do email, it's probably going to be using a JSON web token. And if I do it with Google or Facebook, this is OAuth 2.0. It will probably also use JSON web token to keep me logged for the next request. So yeah, JSON web tokens, OAuth, these are super important ones. Uh, next one is testing. Testing is going to be very interesting. In the previous company where I was, you couldn't just write a feature. If you wanted to have a button on the website, you would also have to create a test that is going to run at regular intervals where a computer is going to make sure that the test, th th that the button you have created is indeed on the page. This way of writing the test before the feature is called TDD, Test Driven Development. Many developers are crazy about it. And they love it and they always write the test even before they write the feature. Tests can be unit when you only test one little thing like the button or end to end. That's a whole process. Like we want the test to simulate the user logging on the website and buying something. This is way more complicated. Uh, for the moment, look into TDD and unit test. It's pretty good if you're able to write even very simple tests. And it's pretty quick to learn as well. Next, databases. There's two kinds of databases, relational and non-relational. Relational means that they, are, they have tables and tables have relationships with each others. So many of you will have learned about SQL or SQL. All these three are just different flavors of SQL, SQLite, MySQL or Postgres, that's the elephant on the left. If you had to choose one today, I would suggest you go with Postgres. Why? Because it's the most professional one. It's the one you're going to see in big companies, but it's also easy enough for you to use it on very small projects. So when you go with relational, I suggest you go with Postgres on the left. However, you will, on easier projects, you will use non-relational databases such as MongoDB. If you had to choose one, I would suggest you go with MongoDB. It's the easiest one and the most common one in, uh, in companies. You have Redis is going to be more used for things that are not very permanent and where you want to make focus on speed. Cassandra is usually more used for anything related to logging and text files. Of course, there's more technologies than that, but these are yeah the bigger ones. CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. These are the technologies that make sure that your code is going to be developed, is going to be pushed in production quickly. Why do we want that? Well, we want our code to be pushed to production as often as possible. When you are doing agile development, we don't want one push to production every two weeks. We want 10 pushes to production every day. The first one you see here is called Jenkins, and Jenkins is going to connect to your GitHub. So that's the one you see here, the second one. Is that GitHub or GitLab? Uh, anyway, they do the same thing. GitHub or GitLab are just repos where you can push your code. Jenkins is going to connect to this code, and every time there's a change, it's going to redeploy it to production. And of course, it can run tests at the same time. CICD is also the process by which, if you have any test that is failing, it's going to refuse to deploy. So for example, you just pushed a new feature and then because of that, one of the tests is failing because you just broke something. Well, this Jenkins is going to see that the test is failing and will refuse the deployment. It's not very hard to put into place. I suggest you play a little bit with Jenkins. Next thing they spoke about here is data structures and algorithms. So this is, we're not going to get into this, but this is more related to databases so more it's closely related to back-end problematics honestly as a front-end developer you're not going to have to work with that as a full stack developer you probably won't even need to go into that because it's a pretty deeper work uh, as a full stack developer myself i'm going to be honest with you i've never had to work with that i've had to work a bit with sorting and trees and that's about it and even that that's something usually very professional back-end developers would do but it's good to know that these things exist. Next one, number nine, is system design. So this is how you want your project to be architectured. Uh, the first one that you see here is TCP versus UDP, and DNS has nothing to do here. Uh, so what is TCP, what is UDP? So these are just two different ways to convey information from one point to another point. So let's say you want to get information from your mom, and, uh, and your mom wants to say, hey, uh, hi, how are you? I'm fine. There's two ways to do it. She could make it with a phone call. So this is TCP when you first need to establish a connection. So she would first need to call you, make sure it's you on the phone. 
and then give you this information. This is called TTP. Or she could just send you a postcard. She writes on the postcard and send it through the mail. It's not scripted, so anyone who sees this package, this UDP package, can read it. And so it's not very safe, but it's faster. And also, there's no guarantee that you will receive this postcard. So UDP is going to be used in instances where we mainly need speed and if it's not too big of a problem if we don't receive the package. So for example, if you are streaming streaming the last episode of Big Bang Theory or Game of Thrones, this is, will be done with UDP packages. Because what happens if you don't receive a package? It's not a big deal. In the worst case, your image is going to flicker for a little second and that's about it. On, as, a, as full stack developers, we will mainly be working with TCP. Anyway, usually we're not going to go too deeper into this because we have these are technologies that we use, we don't really develop them. DNS is just a way that computers translate a domain name into an IP address. So for example, youtube.com is going to be translated to 194.110.1.2. This is a domain name system. Caching. Caching is the way that computers remember information that they have processed before. As software developers, there will be moments when we want to remember information that we have created before. So for example, if we have a website where users can upload videos or images, we want to make sure, for example, that they will not upload the same video twice if we already have it. So we could make a little check, this way of caching something. Next is content delivery networks. So content delivery networks that you see here on the right, this is, these are networks that are professional that we work with that will make sure that your website, first of all, is available. So for example, it will replicate your website on 10 different computers. So if one fails, then the other ones stay accessible. And also it will make sure that the, your users are going to access websites that are, that are close to them. So if you have a user from Japan, they will connect to a server that is closer to Japan than to USA because we want them to be uh, using, yeah, we want good performance for them. The most famous CDN that you can use is Cloudflare. Used all around the world, yeah, Cloudflare. But this is not exactly a problem for full stack developers. This is more a DevOps question, but it's good to know that this exists. Microservices are gonna be something that you will work in medium companies or bigger companies. So there's a whole video that we are that we have on microservices. It's just something big. Microservices it means that instead of having one server, you have you split your server into ten different little servers, and each of these ten different servers. So for example, one is going to be in charge of the payment. One is going to be in charge of uh, the video processing. One is going to be in charge of accounts. One is going to be in charge of basically each one of them is going to have its own responsibility. And if you have more needs of one of these services, you can duplicate one of these services so that you can have maybe 10 instances of the service that does the video treatment, whereas you only need one service for the payment part. We have a whole video about microservices. Anyway, how do they speak to each other? They will need some messaging architecture. I suggest you learn the one in the middle here called RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is the most famous message queue. Uh, so I suggest you learn it. It's not very hard to learn. You could be over it. You could learn the basics in just an hour. Sooner or later, you will experience issues with load balancing. So when you have lots of servers and you want to make sure that the request that a user makes goes to a server that is not too busy, you are going to have to use load balancing. Once again, this is not really an issue for us full stack developers. This is more of a DevOps issue, but it's good to know that, that this exists. Usually this is a problem that is going to be solved by CDN, so Cloudflare does that, but you can also solve it yourself with Nginx here or Apache Tomcat. These web servers also can work as load balancers. So I created a load balancer, for example, a few years ago using Nginx. Sharding, this is what you need to do when you have a database that is going to become that is becoming huge. We need to split it because when you have a database that is huge, yeah, that is several petabytes, yeah, you need to split it. This is called data sharding. You're not going to have to do this as full stack developers. This is more of a DevOps issue. Distributed systems. Yeah, we have a video about that. And database replication. Yeah, all of these are not things that you're going to be using a lot. 
the distribute systems is going to be using to do microservices in our videos. Once again, these are more DevOps issues. Okay, something interesting now, design patterns. So design patterns are not technologies or tools. These are just ways of coding. We have a whole video about design patterns, so we're not gonna speak about this too much right now. Basically, if I had to say things to summarize each one of them, uh, a factory means that instead of creating functions, you create functions that create functions. Dependency injection means that instead of creating code that is difficult to maintain, you try to write code in a way where uh, parts can be removed and replaced easily, like the wheel of a bike that is very easy to replace. Proxy is a way of coding where you don't change objects directly. You use a function that is going to access the object. Observer means that uh, it's a way of coding where one thing, when one thing changed, different elements can Im immediately know they can be subscribed to, to this event. And facade is a way of coding where you only make one small part of your object accessible to the outside. Once again, I'm not gonna enter into the detail, details of this. We have a video about design patterns. And last but not least, AI tools. So we're gonna be using many AI tools to help us. Uh, the ones I suggest you learn to use are ChatGPT, of course, and GitHub Copilot. Uh, this being said, uh, I also suggest you look into, if you don't want to pay for Copilot, there's one that is very good that is called Codium. I personally started using Codium a few weeks ago and, and it replaces GitHub Copilot very well and it's free, so I suggest you look into it. So that's it. These are Byte Byte Go's 11 steps to go from junior to senior developer. Of course, not all of them are here. But if you need any help, I'm always available for you. As a reminder, my name is Ben. I'm a senior software engineer with seven years of experience. I've created lots of things that work on the internet for lots of thousands of users around the world in three different countries. And we'll be looking at all of these in the next videos. See you later.